أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا خاتم النبيين عبد القاسم محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى والطيبين والمعصومين والصاحب المنتجبين ولا جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله peace and blessings be upon Abu Abu Abdullah Imam Hussein alayhi salam and salam alaykum dear brothers and sisters. We're continuing a little bit of what we discussed yesterday on some of the issues that have caused our Muslim world to be asleep for so long. Because if you look at the light of the Prophet that illuminated this dark earth in the dark ages until today, why isn't it that we're not more progressive? Why are we stagnant? Or are we regressing? Why aren't we moving forward? So there's a book written by Mutahiri, a book that's put together in his speeches about the misrepresentations, the fabrications, the lies about what happened in Karbala. Because Karbala was what saved Islam, we know that. But why isn't it taking away oppression of the world? Why is there still so much suffering? So I'm going to give you examples of that, and then we're going to talk of some real actual events that happened in Karbala, talking what happened to Qasim bin Hassan and Abu Fadl al-Abbas. Salawat. Allah. Anybody studied um, somebody named Rumi? Okay, usually in university they cover that. Even the non-Muslim world recognizes some of his poetry. He has a book called Mathnavi. Anyway, in this poetry that he's put together, there's one he talked about the power of love. Now you may say, well, love, what, what could love do? Well, we love Imam Hussein and we know it can change the world. We love Allah, we love the Prophet and his family, we love the Prophets and the companions that were great, and it can change the world. We love our family, we know that can change the world. And what Rumi says in his poetry is so beautiful, he says, Love sweetens matters bitter. Love turns bronze into gold. Wait a minute, what does this mean? He's saying love is something that turns something such a bitter aspect of your life. You're suffering, the trials and tribulations we're going through, but love can change that. The love of Allah can change all that we're going through. The love of the Prophet and all the uh, representatives of Allah on this earth can change that. And, for example, it can turn a bitter thing to sweet and pleasant. So love is an elixir that transforms the bronze into gold. And that's what Rumi was trying to explain. But guess what happens? Now, if you look at what happened, these were fine. You say, okay, no big deal. What's a, what's a big deal about this? People started adding sentences to his poetry. Poetry that he put together, they started adding sentences. And they started putting some crazy stuff. Now, I'm going to give an example. I'm going to try to explain what I mean by all this, right? But take a look. Someone put a sentence, love turns a serpent into an ant. Okay, that sounds nice. So, turn something scary into something weak, okay. Then someone else put, love turns a roof into a wall. <laughs> Why did they bother? I mean, it has nothing to do with what he said. You know, in, in these interpretations, you may see, what's the big deal? Okay, so what, they change it. It's a fabrication, who cares? Does it hurt anybody? No, but it actually, uh, I would say, mellows or puts a, uh, blunts the main concept, the main idea, it softens the blow of the truth. And is it going to change society's life? Is it going to change, make people happy or not? No, it doesn't change much. What they've done with this poetry, adding things, okay, may not change much. However, when it comes to tahrif, what we talked about yesterday, fabrication, when it occurs to things related to our morality, when it occurs in a religion, is dangerous. Now the danger begins. And that's what, especially if the morality in our religion is the foundation of humanity. And this is where the problems begin. Now you may say, give me an example. What are you talking about, brother? Who cares? I add a little extra 
spice into the, you know, the stuff, or a little bit of extra sugar to make it sweeter. Who cares? You know, I'm adding some embellishments. I'm making it nicer. I'm enhancing it. You're actually destroying it. It's like putting vinegar in honey. We're destroying the truth. I'll give an example. The Word of God came for 124,000 prophets. 313 prophets actually came with the message of God. They're called the Mursalim prophets. Their words were changed by the people. Now look at the, the Old Testament. They call the Torah. Today, if you look at it, they say, for example, Harun, the brother of Musa, made the idols for the people when Musa went to the mountain. This is the Old Testament. But the Quran clarifies, there's no way. There was someone named Samiri. Harun tried to stop them. But these are examples of, you can say, well, if a prophet can do bad things, and I, well, why can't we? And if you look at the, for example, the Bible is filled with prophets making sins. They never did. They said the, the worst of things that the prophets have done. And that's why you may see immorality in the world. If you look in the, in the Bible, the New Testament, I don't want to put down any communities or religions or groups, but just talking facts, there are examples of 23 cases, for example, of incest in the Bible. I mean, I can't even think of 23 versions. And how horrible it is to talk about such things. And then they said the prophets did these things. For example, Prophet Lut. If you look at Genesis, they said he did these things. I'm stuck for a lot. How could we follow someone who's done those things? These are all fabrications or lies. And this is what I mean when they change the word of God. This is what happens. And Allah talks about them in the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 13. Allah says, Bismillah by on, on account of their breaking their covenant, their promise, we removed the mercy from, from them. We removed our mercy, Allah says. And their hearts became hard. They altered the words from their places and they neglected a portion what was reminded of it. And you shall always discover treachery in them, accepting a few of them, so part of them and turn away from them. Allah is saying, look how bad what they did. They changed the word of God to change it to the way they want to live. They didn't like the word of God saying, okay, don't do this and do this. They took it and changed it. We today, Muslims today, are trying, but they can't change the Quran. We know that. It can't be changed. It's memorized by over 10 million people on earth today. Anyone who asks Surah Fatih in this room, Surah Ikhlas, you can tell me with word for word. If someone changes the words, you know it. So the Quran can't be changed, but then they try to change the tafsir. They try to change the, the exegesis, meaning the interpretation of Quran. They try to change the hadith. Hadith has been changed. They try to change so much, and the worst change, I have to say, is when they take the historical events that happened and destroy the true meaning of what happened. And this is what we're talking about today. The fabrications, and Mutahi writes a book about this, of what happened and what's wrong with all this. So the event of Karbala must be retold exactly without any distortions. Now, I tried to get some of that information and in the end of the discussion. We'll talk about some, what, some things that really happened. And just listening to what really happened will move us. We don't need the extra sugar and you know, salt and pepper. We don't need that stuff. We just need the truth. Now, if you think that we can listen to stories of history and we will benefit from them, we won't if there are lies will actually be go regressive. And this is why the Muslim world is regressing, going backwards, they're not going forwards. Most regrettably, there's thousands and thousands of distortions about what happened in Ashura, on the day of Ashura. Both in the outward form, in terms of what was the history, the episodes, what happened, the examples of the fights and the everything. All this has been distorted, a lot of it, from major to minor. And also, what has been distorted is the interpretation of what happened. The meaning of why it happened. Why did these things happen? That's also been changed. So, Mutari explains that there's a, there's a, a sheikh named um, Haji Nuri who put together a book. And, you know, when they put together the truth, people don't like it. And they put all this information together for us to benefit from today in the 21st century. The two things they focused on is one... When a speaker comes here and talks, in any majlis of Imam Hussein, they call him the Husseinis around the world. There's thousands of masjids on this earth, filled with people, but the Iman in the heart is empty. Why? What has happened? Well, one of the issues is the intention of the person who's giving a sermon, talking, 
if it's for greed, if it's to get popularity and success and power and name and try to make people cry and make everybody love that person, you know it's doomed for failure. It should not be for money. It should not be for glory. It should be purely fi Allah. Everything we do in life should be for Allah. So the main point is get the, the intention back on track of doing this for Allah. Imam Hussein died for us, for Allah. Not for us, but for, to pleasing God. The second thing they talked about is the problem with the narrations, the stories, the history. I know it gets boring when we talk about this stuff. You may say, why bother, brother? Just make me cry. I'm here to cry for Imam Hussein. Well, then you've come to the wrong place. If that's your intention, that's not what we're going to do today. Our goal today is to get closer to Allah. If that's by finding out what the wrongs were in history and clarifying it and get the truth, that's what we want. And we're not, we don't have much time, so let's move quickly and see what we can do. For example, by Allah, what they've attributed to Imam Hussein, I mean, it's, it's like examples of what you call a low, mediocre person. Someone who is of a low class, someone who has no dignity, of no shame. When the killing was happening in Karbala, in the Battle of Ashur, the, night, the day of Ashura, the afternoon Ashur, when prayers were happening, we know that they couldn't pray properly in terms of the way we pray, two rakat, four rakat, you know, normally. They have to do Salat al khawf which is when your life is in danger. And the two people come in and move, they switch places and there's movements going just so the battle is happening, they're being protecting, they're protecting the Imam. They say, unfortunately in history, and you go to a lot of this mourning of Imam Hussein, they want us to feel extra sad. They say Imam Hussein wanted his son, sorry, his, his nephew, to marry his niece, sorry, his daughter. He wanted his nephew to marry his daughter. They say, in the battle of Karbala, he says, I have one wish. I want my daughter to wed my nephew right here, right now, even when all this is happening, and this is what I want. Are you kidding? There's a battle, fighting going. You, is that what you want? This is a lie, brothers and sisters. I know some people, I asked one sister yesterday, have you heard this? Yeah, but they didn't get married, really. Some people say, yeah, they did get married. It's nothing to do with marriage. Nothing, nothing ever happened like that. These are all lies to make us cry. It's oh wow, he, he couldn't get his daughter married. Qasim was 13 years old. I mean, you're getting him married kind of young, right? Don't you think? Well, this whole history, unfortunately, these are all perpetuated lies to make us cry, or maybe make money out of this. I don't know, or to keep us <laughs> stupid and dumb and ignorant, and that's the big problem. If we're not aspiring to get near to God through gaining knowledge of Him, then how are we getting near to Him? Okay, by doing good actions. But an action of someone who is ignorant and doesn't know what he's doing could actually be bad. You could be making a mistake. You can say, for example, I love soccer. Some of you call it football. But you say, I'm so good at it, and you kick the ball in the wrong net. Okay, you're good at kicking, but you're making going the wrong way. That happens in example, people go crazy, right? Can you imagine you're trying to do good and you're scoring for the wrong team? And you're making mistakes in life? It's horrible. This is what could happen in life as a Muslim. You think you're doing right. For example, I'll give you an example. They used to do it in New York. I lived in New York for over 30 years. In New York, they would have these processions downtown Manhattan. And they would cry for Imam Hussein. Fine. They would take their shirts off and beat their chests. In the winter? And why? Why do you take your clothes off? That's not the way Imam Hussein would want it. Okay, fine. You do all these things, it's between you and God, fine. I don't think it's very recommended in Islam. I think people run away from Islam after seeing those big belly guys. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> when they get to prayers, this is what's shocking. They don't pray. They'll take their clothes off in the streets of Manhattan, but when it came to prayer, Salah, no one prayed. Maybe two lines of thousands of people. I said to myself, I'm not ever coming back to this thing. It's, it was a shame. I mean, we're living to get near to God and then we embarrass the Muslim world by what happens. Anyway, these are examples. Again, people can do what they want, but make sure you do it with intelligence. Okay, other examples. You may say, well, I said this yesterday. Some of you heard it, some of you didn't. They say Imam Hussein was a, a superstar, a powerful warrior of God. Of course he was. He was the son of Imam Ali. We know that and the grandson of the Prophet, we know he was great. There was only 30,000 men that came in the battle. 
But what did I say yesterday? What do some people say? How many people he killed? Yes? Yeah, 300,000. Some people say he killed 300,000. There were only 30,000 enemies. How could you kill 300,000? You know, count. How long does it take? One second a kill. Give me the hours. How long? 300,000 seconds last. Yes? It takes uh, three days. Yeah, but how many hours, they say? No, a little more. 84 hours, approximately. <laughs> Hiroshima, when they dropped the bomb, they killed 80,000 people in that second. Fine. How could this happen that he can kill so many people? These are stories to make him look, his valor look great. Yeah, but you're embellishing. And they say, well, the poets say this. Not the spells, the poets. But still, the zakir, the, yeah, come on. This is not right. When you say untruth, it doesn't make it better. It makes it, people say, you know what? This is a fairy tale, it didn't happen. And to the point that you go to some countries like, say Trinidad. I have a brother, my brother went to Trinidad with Brother Hussain, and they went and they witnessed a procession like you saw in Manhattan. Guess what they were doing? They were dancing Calypso. And they were saying it's, it's the, the procession of, they say Hussein, but they say with a J, they, I don't know how they pronounce it. And it's a battle between Imam Hussein and Imam Hassan. They fought each other, two brothers fought each other. The story became so fabricated till today that it's completely wrong. What happened? They started hearing wrong stories when the Muslims came to Guyana and Trinidad as you know, servants. They, they used to still practice Islam until they were oppressed and then the wrong things came out. To the point that they're drinking in the procession of Imam Hussein in the 21st century in these countries. Why? Because scholars taught them wrongly. People did not stand up against falsehood. They said, oh, it makes people cry, fine. That's not good. To the point that they started stop crying, started dancing and laughing and doing worse things and not commemorating the truth. This is what happens in the world. And you may say Imam Hussein was a superstar, but look what Allah says to the Prophet. Allah says to the Prophet, say this. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kul innama ana basharum mithluhum. Allah said, yuhi. Allah says to the Prophet, say that I am a, a mortal like you. You know? I'm just like you. Yuhaa ila annama ilahukum ilahun wahid. So he says, I'm a mortal like you to whom we have revealed that there is no God but Allah. This is what the Prophet is. The Prophet says, I'm just like another human being like you. So then why do we over exaggerate the others, like Abu Fadl Abbas and Imam Hussein? Allah is saying to the Prophet, say, I'm just like another human being. Yes, he was a special. He was the Prophet of God, the last Prophet. The light of him is illuminating the earth because Allah created the universe for him. The love of the first creation Allah made. We know that. He, he is great. But as a human being, he's a, he's a mortal. He's a physical person like us. We can aspire to become like them, but never get there. You'll never get there. In terms of morality, in terms of their strength, in terms of how they're intelligent. We'll never get there. But our goal is to try to emulate them. You can never become like them. We know that. But there are role models and we should follow them. If you think they're superstars and they can jump and fly and things like that off a, a roof, you're not going to try. You're gonna forget about being like them. See, this is what they want. They say, forget about being like them. Just continue to be a, a fool, a sinner. This is why I'm like this today. Because I'm a fool, I'm a sinner. No, I have to stop. We all have to stop. Okay, another example that relates, and I know this is tough for us to swallow. I even made this mistake myself. Once I read in a book, Arba'in, someone asked me to speak in Arba'in, I made a mistake. They say the caravan of Karbala went to Kufa, went to Syria. They walked, guys. How long do you think it took? Walking from Karbala to Kufa, and slowly. Okay, they didn't have fast riding horses. Some of them were walking chained. Some of them were on camels, but they were suffering slowly grudging. How long do you think? And then from Kufa, they went to Syria. Anybody's gone by bus from Syria to uh, Iraq? I did that one. It's long, okay? And then back, oh my God. I, I just, I cried. Just imagining what the Ahlul Bayt went through. This is a long time ago, back in 96. Now you can fly. I don't even know if you can, but you can fly into the parts of the world. I don't know about Syria, but at least to Iraq. They say an Arba'in, the 40th, after Imam Hussein, they said the whole caravan of Karbala came back. After being in prison, after all that, impossible. That story is a fabrication. Okay, it makes us feel bad, 
Yes, Imam Hussein's body was there, and all the caravan came back to mourn on the 40th day for their death. It's a fabrication. It's not true. I know it hurts us because we've been hearing this for years. But who, you know, look, what does it matter if they came back on the 40th or the 50th or the 60th? It doesn't matter to us. That they came back or they, they were able to do some good, that's more important. The saddest that they died for us, more important than their bodies is what their, their spirit, their morality, what they did for us. That's what's important. Other examples, for example, uh, I know this is kind of crazy, but you can see that I don't know why this happens, but we want to feel sorry for the Prophet and his family, and it's important to do so. So, for example, they say, and what a thing to say, they say that uh, Hadrat Zahra, say the Fatima Zahra, that she's a little child, and that she goes around weeping, crying, even though after 14 centuries, and we're, always, we're only commemorating this whole Karbala event just to console her, just to make, you know, we feel sorry for her. That's why we're doing this. If this is why we're doing this thing for 1400 years, just so we just feel sorry for them, then we don't understand the message. This is a, such a kind of belief that's destructive to religion. Imam Hussein established practical ideology for us. He, he, he practiced Islam and he showed us how to live it in a practical role, as a role model. And he did this all for the Islamic movements of teaching us Amr bin Maruf, Nahi al joining good, forbidding evil, Salah, all the things Islam taught us to be kindness to humanity, kindness to animals, you know, all the things that he taught us. And we're feeling sad because of, you know, a little girl named Sayyidah Fatima is crying. Come on. Aren't they in heaven together right now? Aren't they in paradise and in, with each other? Of course they are. So why do we say these stories? Again, it's sad, but it's to make us all cry, embellish the stories. Now, one important thing is the leader of faith from the time of, the leaders of faith from the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, and all the pure Imams have commanded, they commanded us that we should commemorate Imam Hussein. They commanded us. Imam, well, the Prophet was alive, even he did. Because when Imam Hussein was born, he cried. Because he knew what the people would do to him in the future. And he prepared the world. And he kept showing them that these are the Sayyidah Shabab Ahl al Jannah. Hassan Hussein are the leaders of the youth of paradise. And he would say, Hussein al Minni, Wa'an al Minni, Hussein. I am from Hussein, and Hussein is of me. And what did they do? They butchered him, they killed him. They, they took totally against the truth and they fought. Now we need to say, well, what does that mean going forward? Why did Imam Hussein die? Now we've figured it all out. Why? Now, in the ziyarah of Ahl bayt of Imam Hussein, you may see it all the time. You say, you say, I bear witness, Ashadu, uh, that I bear witness that he established prayer. I bear witness that he gave zakat and commanded what is right and forbid what was wrong and, and did such a struggle in the way of God that is, ought to be done. This is why he did his message. This is why the Ahlul Bayt want us to remember him again and again and again. Now, I know all this sounds nice, but it doesn't make you cry. And I'm telling you, the goal of this Muharram is we want to feel sad. You know, it's like watching a sad story movie, you want to cry at the end of the movie. You know, like for example, I saw this one movie about this father had a wife and then they broke up, but they had a daughter. In the whole movie, the daughter wanted to live with the father. In the end, they were struggling with the daughter or the husband or the wife. In the end, the girl dies. And they, you start crying. You say, wow, this poor little girl, they're fighting for her. But in the end, the girl, the baby dies. This, it's a sad story. And yeah, is that what we're doing this for? Of course not. We're doing this for to look at what Ahl Bayt stood for and, and do something about it. And cry that we are messing up in life and wake up. Now, I gave this example yesterday. Who remembers the example when uh, Mutahari went to this one town and the people were screaming, crying. What, did it, what happened? Yes. Exactly. Can you imagine? The sheikh, uh, Mutahari asked the sheikh, what did, you, what did you just do? Why are you doing this? He said, these people are hard-hearted. They won't cry. Probably even if you show them that sad movie, they won't cry, right? These people won't cry. They're hard-hearted people. He says, the only way for the me to make them cry for the, for the majlis of Imam Hussein is that I have to throw rocks at them. And when the lights were turned, they were bleeding. 
talk about the ignorance in the 21st, oh, this was 100 years ago or 80 years ago, whatever, but still, can you imagine? Anyway, Imam Hussein cried out that the causes and motives of his uprising coincide with the general principles of Islam. That's why Imam Hussein stood. We insult Imam Hussein and his life, and we think his life was in vain. It's about the butchery of what happened. No, it's about him standing up for truth and justice against the oppressors. We need to do that. When you see something wrong in your company, in your job, when the manager is doing something wrong, you need to stand up. I gave examples that I had, you know, in that company with the same situations, and I, Allah's help, I was able to stand up. And Allah saved me from their daggers, I'm telling you, because the knives will come. The backstabbing in corporate life is horrible, but it happens every day. Thereafter, Muslims in any fashion, they say, well, Muslims, we're going to get them put on. In the U.S., one out of three African Americans are put in jail. Why? Why are they so oppressed? Because then once you're in jail and you have a felony, you can never vote also. So they are an oppressed nation. Guess who's next? Us. The Muslims. But there's two billion. They're going to put two billion in jail. They don't even have enough jails. But in America and Canada, they do. At least for the Muslims that are here. Be ready. They're after us. In any way, in any fashion. We have to be good people as the Prophet taught us to live and do good on this earth and give charity and help the poor and feed the hungry. And if you're doing anything right, you have nothing to worry. Just don't make a jaywalk crossing the street because you're going to get stopped. Unfortunately, in Europe, they should do that to us. Anyway, the Prophet said there are three hazards in the religion of Islam. In religion, there's three hazards. One problem are scholars with evil conduct. And I can give you millions of examples, but I don't want to. Another one is a, a, a tyrannical leader, a ruler. And we saw examples of that. For example, Saddam and Hitler. Yes? Um, um, George Bush? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, there, there's even more evil rulers like, like, like Moabia, Yazid. Yes. Um, there's, there's some uh, Bani Abbas. Banu Maya? Yeah. Mashallah. Excellent. Good. Alhamdulillah. I'm impressed with you. So you know history. But even today, when you see people acting like that, who are fake and playing games and the evilness and the killing and the massacring, you say, no, this is wrong. ISIS is the example. What is his name? Abu Bakr Baghdadi, you know? Sounds like a comedy. He said, what? This guy's an idiot killing people think he's a caliph of the Muslim world. Unfortunately, people are listening to him. I don't know how many, maybe the same 30,000, but they're listening, unfortunately. So, a horrible leader, and the, the third thing, which is a hazard to Islam, it looks at us, unfortunately. The Prophet says, the person who is diligent in practicing religion, but in ignorance. So if we're practicing Islam, but we don't know what we're doing, that's a hazard to the Islam. The example is ISIS. They pray a lot, they fast a lot, they got some big beard and stuff like that. But they're a hazard to Islam. If we are ignorant of the truth, and I'm glad you know history, so alhamdulillah, you're okay. We need to change and gain knowledge. And I'm glad we're all, we're all here to learn about what happened in Karbala. So I want to talk about a little bit what happened in Karbala. But before I do that, let me give you some more examples. One day an alam is faced with a difficulty. Is he going to look at the community and look at their weaknesses? Or, and do something about it, in terms of gaining them out of the ignorance and gaining knowledge, what was going to happen to them? Is he going to make much money? Probably not. But again, the goal should be money. What happens is people take advantage of our weaknesses and try to crush us, our faith, in terms of making us cry and keep us dumb. For, how many years you guys been going to Muhammad? And you say, what did you gain out? What did you remember what the guy said? I don't know, but Abu Fadl of us, wow. I love his fighting. Yeah. What are you going to do about it now? Oh, you know, Qasim, you poor guy, didn't get married. Come on. Is that what we get out of it? No, we need to get more. And I want to talk about them. So when I talk about them, let's listen to how they lived in, in the last days of their, the last minutes of their life. See how, what valor, courage, intelligence they had, love of God they had. But before that, let's do a du'a. We beseech Allah to lead our hearts to the truth. Forgive us of our sins, which we have committed through this tahrif applications and otherwise, 
to grant us the ability to carry out successfully the duty and mission that is in what we're supposed to follow. Now let's look at Karbala. Salawat. Allahumma salli The Imam Hussain is with his companions, with his family, and the night of Ashura, which is the night before the fighting in the day. And he is telling them, you are all free. Think about it. Imam Hussain is not trying to get people to join him. He says, you know what, guys, you could go. Leave me. That's okay. They're after me. You guys can go. He says, you are all free. My companions, members of my family, my sons and my nephews, everyone to leave without being liable to anything. They, the enemy's forces, have nothing against anyone except me. They want me. They want my head. You guys go. And the night is dark, he says. Take advantage of this darkness. And leave and depart at this night. Go. They won't see you. They will definitely not stop you. At first, he expresses his appreciation for them and tells them, I am most pleased with you. I do not know any companions better than mine and no better relatives than the members of my family. He's saying these are the greatest companions that ever lived in history. These companions and my family and these people who are here with me now, there's no one on earth and no one in previous history or future has ever been as great as you. And you know, it's funny, one um, sheikh, one mujtahid actually, when he read this specific sentence, he says, I can't be true. What about the Battle of Badr, the 313? Well, do you know some of the Battle of Badr went against Ahl al-Bayt later on? Anyway, but they, they, he said, what about these guys? What about that Ohud, you know, Kandak, Hunain, the eight of people who fought 4,000 and they won? You know, they've got to be better people than this. That night he had a dream, and he was in the land of Karbala, in the Battle of Ashura. In the battle. So the arrows are flying and the swords are going and he's like, wow, I'm here, I can't believe it. And then he says, Imam, he sees Imam Hussein and he starts you know, feeling sad. Imam says, just stand there, let me just pray. So he's standing there and the arrows started coming. And then Mujtahid got scared and he ducked. And the arrows hit Imam. And then Imam Hussein said, didn't I tell you, my companions are better than anyone that ever lived on this earth. You know why? Because they took the arrows to protect the Salah. We throw the Salah and going and watching arrow and stuff like that. <laughs> no, it's, we're in a crazy time today. Anyway, so let me continue. So Qasim, he says, you know, so wait a second. So Qasim, son of Imam Hassan, goes on to his uncle. And what do you think he's asking? He goes to the Imam. And look, can you imagine what he's going to ask? What does he want? 13 year old dude, you know. What is he going to want? A teenager. What does he want? In those days, Imam Hussein had nobody. But he calls him, on the day of Ashur, he's saying to his uncle, he, he says, Imam asks him a question. He, he knows what Qasim wants. Imam asks him a question okay, you want to go to this battle? Do you want to be involved? Do you want to be in this situation? Imam says, I want to ask you a question. Let me first ask you a question, and I will reply you after you answer me. Imam Hussein says, Allah subhanahu wa I think that the Imam purposely asked this question. With this question, he wanted to show the posterity that they shouldn't think that this youth gave his life without awareness or understanding. He wanted the world to know this youth knew what he was doing. And then they shouldn't imagine these crazy thoughts about him wanting to be a, a bride, you know, a groom getting bride, married to his bride. They shouldn't think these crazy thoughts of Qasim. He wanted the people to understand how much intelligence he had. So, Imam Hussein asked him first, I will ask you. So, really to explain the character of Imam, Imam's uh, nephew, Qasim. He says, my child, my nephew, tell me, how do you regard death? And what do you think about getting killed? I ask you that. Who's 13? Anybody? Okay, 14. All right, 14, brother. What do you think of what... The same question. What do you think of death? And what do you think about getting killed? No way, brother. I'm going the other way. <laughs> of course. That's how we are. We're, it's like our goal is to live. 
We don't want to die tomorrow, right? We want to do more good on this earth. You know, we have a lot of things to do. Watch the next episodes of, you know, shows. Okay. But look at Gossam. I know it's not... I, I, maybe I shouldn't make us laugh because this is the part that's sad. Look what happened. I'm trying to get the emotions up, but in, in a nice way. Gossam, I'm telling you, this was like the moon of Bani Hashem, the, the light of the family, okay? He says, it is sweeter than honey. You may say, honey, isn't it kind of a little bit tough to eat? That is, I says, he says, I haven't a desire that should be more dearer to me and sweeter to me than going and dying in the way of Allah. Can you imagine? Okay, he's protecting Imam Hussein. He's protecting Islam. This is 1,400 years ago when things like that were more common. Today you have to be 18 to be in the battles, right? This is an astounding scene. These are the things that have made this historical event great. When Qasim said that, you understood what he knew. He knew what he was talking about. He understood that to him, more dear to the, anything else. I mean, this is a 13-year-old guy who had nothing, you know, in terms of his life is still ahead of him. He says, I would rather be in the way of God right now. I want to go back to God. I want to return. So Imam Hussein gave them the opportunity. And if you look at it, there will be an, never another Imam Hussein in history. There will never be another Qasim in history. What has happened for us to have Islam today? We are so blessed to have had them do this for us. What did they want from us? To live this religion in the way of God. Not throw it in this garbage. Not abandon Salah. How could we abandon prayers? How could we abandon fasting? How could we abandon Zakat? And charity and caring for the world. They died for us to have this faith. Imam Hussein says, my nephew, you too will be killed. But your death will be different than and everyone else that has died already. Different than others. And it will be after you have faced a great ordeal. He's telling Qasim, you sure you want to go? You're going to be killed. You're going to suffer a lot. Accordingly, when Qasim, after much insistence, he pushed for it, received the permission to leave for the battlefield. Being very young, there was no armor that even fit him. He couldn't even have armor to protect him from the that was coming. Because he was too you know, young and small. He couldn't even have boots to go in the battlefield. They say he had a, his sandals and one of his sandals were even broken. The enemy say, I saw his string of his sandal. You know, I mean, my God. You see a young kid, you're still going to kill him? This is the world we're living in. This is if you go and watch the videos of what's happening to... The poor Muslims of the world, and the poor Christians of the world, and the poor oppressed of the world. Even there's a sad group called the Yazidis, they're being killed too. I mean, all these groups are being killed by this ISIS nonsense. It's happening again in the 21st century, in Iraq again. I saw one show that on YouTube, they, they started killing 12-year-old kids because they didn't accept them. It's happening again. But not like the Qasim. Anyway, Qasim, alayhi salam, he didn't have the armor, didn't have the weapons that he could handle to lift, but he went, and he went with fervor. He got the permission to go. There was no helmet for him. They didn't have proper anything for him. It is written that he wore uh, an amama to, to look a little older, to look tough, and he went in the battlefield and described the descriptiveness given of his appearance. They said this young boy was so handsome that the enemies saw him and described him as a piece of the moon. The, the poets say, where does the wind carry the petal of a red rose? Said, whoever that saw you on that, your fleeting mount, when whoever saw you, they were saying, my God, this is like a petal of a rose moving and flying toward us. Qasim was in trouble, of course, because these people attacked him. And then Imam was saying, when he saw that, he flew like a falcon on his horse. As he arrived by the side of this youth, there were about 200 vicious people around him. Can you imagine? 200 people surrounded Qasim. They surrounded this child. They fled as soon as they saw the Imam was attacking. And one of the enemy's men who was dismounting to sever Qasim's head was himself trampled by the... You know, all these people running away from the comrades. But unfortunately, Imam, Imam's nephew died, Qasim died. 
Now this, this is a sad story, and this is why I say this story is because as a youth, you need to realize it doesn't matter how old you are in life, you need to stand up and do good. You don't need to be in the battlefield and fight physically. That's not what our lives are for today. Our lives are today to fight spiritually against our sins, our mistakes of life, and to do good. Now I want to tell you about another great story. The story is, you know when you saw Imam Ali alayhi salam's story when he says to his brother Akil, he says to his brother, you know, I want to find a wife, and this is after Fatima Zahra had died, alayhi salam, that I want to find a wife who will give me a descendant who will be a heroic a warrior of God, and who will give birth to someone of great valor. And Akil suggested, Umm al -Bani. And this story is true. It did happen in the street. Based on all the events of this, this did happen. And Imam Ali's wish came true because guess who was born? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Allahumma salli ala According to one of the reports, on the day of Ashur, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas came to Imam and he said, Dear brother, now you give me permission. Everybody's dead. He said, now you give me permission. He said, this chest of mine is suffocating and I can't bear it anymore. I want to sacrifice my life for your sake. Imam responded to Abu al-Fadl al He gave him his request and he said, Brother, I ask you one thing. Now that you want to leave, try to get some water for these children. Abu al-Fadl al had already come to receive the nickname of Saka, which is the water carrier, because you know what he used to do? When his camp needed water in those nights of the last nights, he used to go and sneak and get water and bring it back. He was able to do that. You know, some of the stories that there's no water three days and three nights, let me tell you, that's not really true, but they still got chances to do gusels, and they got to the water, and there was water, but on the day of Ashura, there wasn't. And some of the nights before, you know, it was tough. Very little. Ashur, nothing. So he's telling Abu Falabas, please go get some water. Help these poor children. They don't have anything. What a spirit of understanding and self-sacrifice. Abbas alone, alayhi salam, by himself, advances against the host. He descends along the river bank and leads his horse right into the water. There were thousands of people there and he went right through them. Passed right through them. They were scared. They moved away. He gets into the water, and all historians have said this. They've all written this. He said, first he fills the water skin that he brought, and he laid it on his shoulder. Then he takes water into his hand and raises them somewhat near his lips. But instead of drinking the water, he just drops it. What would we do when we're dying of thirst at that point? Why did he do that? And what is interesting is, do you know he was reciting poetry while he's fighting? He was talking and he was reciting you know, beautiful words, Arabic poetry, while he was in this fight. But talking to himself. And the people around him, as they surrounded him, they were listening to him. And he says, when he's, and you know what, you can understand why he didn't take that water. But listen to his poetry. Look at what he says. He says, will you drink a cold water? While there stands Hussein thirsty near the tents, he's talking to himself, alayhi salam. And what about, in about to drink, Imam Hussein is there standing at the tent and about to drink the cup of death. He's, let me say it again. Will you drink a cup of cold water? Did you drink this cold water? While there stands Imam Hussein thirsty near the tents and about to drink the cup of death, such is not the way of my faith nor that which abides in the conviction of the truth. What would become of caring love? Isn't Imam Hussein your Imam? Isn't he your follower? Aren't you his follower? Again, never. My faith does not permit me to do that. My loyalty does not allow me to do such a thing. While Abu Falabas went towards the camp, and he went a different direction toward the palm trees this time, to get there quicker, the people heard Abu Fadl Abbas saying more poetry, and it appeared that something had happened to Abu Fadl Abbas at that point when he went through it. Now he cried out, By Allah, even if you sever my right hand, it will, I will persist in defending my faith. And the Imam, and who is the true one for certain, 
And the Prophet's grandson, pure and trustworthy. He's, and basically, you know what's happening to him. They chopped his right arm off now. Oh my soul, fear not the faithless. Don't be scared of these people. And receive the good news of the Almighty's mercy. In the company of the Prophet, the Master, and the elect, though incidentally they have slashed my left hand, they write that something turned the water skin, and you know, the arrows were coming, hitting the water skin, but look at the way he, his dexterity was. He went and grabbed the, the water skin with his head. No arms, going to fight. This happened in history, guys. I don't know where in other stories you can ever imagine such an event. And he was still struggling to get the water back to his family, to his, 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 his nephews and nieces. And, his, and you know what happened, and I don't need to repeat it, but he fell to his death. And you know Imam Hussein came, and he cried that his back was broken. We know that. We hear that story all the time. But I want to take you back to his mom, his mother, which we know was of specialness because Akil is telling Imam Ali alayhi salam, this is the lady you should marry, Umm al -Bani. And she gave four sons in Karbala that day. So it was a custom that on the 9th of Muharram, the night, that they would you know, cry and they would go to the graveyard and they would cry and just mourn for what happened. That one day Umm al the mother of the Abbas, while she was alive, at the time of the end of Karbala, though she was in Medina at the time, she was given the news that her four sons were martyred in Karbala. This saintly woman will go to Baki cemetery and mourn over her sons. Today, you can't even go to Baki. You go to Hajj and they don't even let you in. The oppression is still there till the 21st century. And that they had beautiful graves, mausoleums, and they destroyed it. The Turkish Empire allowed it, and unfortunately the Saudis destroyed it. Oh, they think we're grave worship. We're not grave worshiping. If we're grave worshiping, then we should be worshiping the Prophet's grave, which has a masjid. We don't grave worship. We worship Allah. And we say salam, assalamu alaykum, ayyuhun nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's like we say, assalamu alaykum, ya Abu Abdullah Hussein. We don't worship them. We're giving our salams and may Allah's blessings be upon them. Anyway, I want you to hear what Umm al Benin said about her children who had died. This saintly woman, she went to Baki and she would mourn over her sons and she would remember her sons at, at all times, especially Abu Fadl Abbas, especially Abbas, the eldest of them, who was the senior most of all the brothers, both in respect of age as well as in respect of spirituality, intelligence, and his bodily merits. Umm al the mother of Abbas, one who was truly cared for the youth, said in an elegy, and this is what she said, that translates in English. O observant eye, tell me, who have you been, who has been to Karbala and watched its scenes and observed the moment when Abu Fadl Abbas, my son of a lion, who was my, who with my other lion's cubs following him, attacked by a cowardly crowd, tell me, is it true? that I have been told that these cowards attacked my son? They say that when they had cut my son's arms, an iron club fell upon my dear one's head. Is that true, she said? Then she says, Oh, Abu Fadl Abbas, my dear, I know that if you had arms, that wasn't, a, there was not a man in this whole world would have had the guts to face you. They had the audacity to do that to you because your arms have been severed from your body. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun ridan bi kadahi wa tasliman li amri Assalamu alaykum ya abul fadl labas Assalamu alaykum ya Qasim ibn al-Hassan alayhi salam. Wa sayya'lamu al-ladhina dhalamu ayyim al-karmi al-karmi wa Allah. Allah says in Quran, They who acted unjustly shall know in what final place their turning shall be turned back. Salawat. Allah. 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 Allah